what is a controlled experiment? To understand what a controlled experiment is, we're going to walk through an example of an experiment where a polio vaccine was tested for its effectiveness in the 1950s. As we go through this example, we'll talk about the terms and definitions associated with a controlled experiment. So just to give you a quick backstory, the first polio epidemic hit the United States in 1916, and during the next 35, 40 years, hundreds of thousands of victims died, especially children. And then in the 1950s, there was a vaccine, the Salk vaccine, that was showing promise in laboratory trials. And so they wanted to test it in the real world with real children to see how effective it was. And this test, that's the experiment we're going to talk about here. Okay, now to do an experiment to test the effectiveness of the vaccine, you can think about how in general what they want to do is give some children the vaccine, don't give others the vaccine, and then compare those two groups to see the effectiveness of the vaccine. That's the general approach. But we're going to get into more specifics of how they actually did the experiment as we go through this video. So these two groups that are going to be compared, the group of children that are given the vaccine, that's called the treatment group. The hypothesis is applied to these subjects. Right, the hypothesis is the vaccine. The hypothesis is that this vaccine will cure polio, at least at a significant rate. The group of kids that aren't given the vaccine, that's called the controls or the control group. Those kids are called controls and they, they make up the control group. The hypothesis is not applied to these subjects. Okay, now the main variable that you're analyzing, so in this situation, the effectiveness of the vaccine, that's called the independent variable. Independent variable or variables. In this polio vaccine case, there's just one independent variable. Okay, and the method that is used to come to useful conclusions is comparison. Where you observe differences or similarities between groups. In this situation, the control group and the treatment group. Okay, now, one thing to note is that you can think about the idea of the most ideal controlled experiment the perfectly designed controlled experiment. And in fact, the term controlled experiment, just as a, as a term, as a definition, you can think of as referring to the, the perfectly designed controlled experiment. In that case, the only variables that are at play between the treatment group and control group are the independent variables. There is zero effect of any other variables between the treatment group and control group other than the independent variable or variables. That's the, the, the perfect ideal controlled experiment. And that's mainly what we're talking about in this video. This polio vaccine experiment was designed to be as close to a true controlled experiment as they could get it. But in reality, there's no experiment that's a perfect controlled experiment. And we'll see how this polio vaccine experiment wasn't perfect but it was designed to be as close to an ideal controlled experiment as, as they could get it. Okay, so the first thing you might be thinking is, well, why didn't they just administer the vaccine to a large number of children and see if it worked? Well, they couldn't do this because the way the epidemic worked was that any given year, there could be a larger or smaller outbreak. So from 1952 to 1953, there was a large drop in outbreak but there was no vaccine administered, so they couldn't in 1954 just administer the vaccine to a bunch of kids, and, and they wouldn't know how to interpret, interpret the results. So they needed to do an experiment. And so the only way to find out whether the vaccine worked was to deliberately leave some children unvaccinated and use them as controls, right? Controls. So you have the control group, but then, but then you can also call the subjects in the control group controls. But however, this was an ethical issue because you have to deliberately leave some children unvaccinated, right? So one idea they had was there were some parents who wouldn't consent to their child receiving the vaccine. They didn't want the vaccine. And so they said, well, why don't we have the children of those parents 
be the control group and then consenting parents be the treatment group. Children of consenting parents be the treatment group. Sounds like a good idea. There was an issue with this because non-consenting parents, a larger percentage were, were low-income families. And children in low-income families were more immune to the disease, which is kind of counterintuitive because you typically think that the poor are more susceptible to disease, but this was a special case where it was the opposite. It was because of hygiene is involved and the lower income children have a poor hygiene environment as, as they're getting older. And so what, what happens is they, they, they get a milder form of polio earlier, develop an immunity to it. And so they can, they can fight off the, the more deadly form later, but the more hygienic, higher income kids didn't develop that immunity. And so the problem is if they use these, the lower income family kids as the control group, that would introduce a bias against the vaccine into the study. Against the vaccine because in favor of the vaccine, the control group wouldn't do as well, but the treatment group would do well. Well, you would have the control group with these low income children being more immune, seeming to not need the vaccine compared to the treatment group. And this extraneous variable, that's not the independent variable or, or one of the independent variables, gets mixed up or confounded with the effects of the main independent variables. So confounding variables or extraneous variables that, uh, that affect the main variables being studied and thus the results of the experiment. Now, it's important to note that, again, there's no perfect, there's no perfectly controlled experiment. And so for any experiment, you're going to have to make decisions on what biases are acceptable or unacceptable, what confounding variables are acceptable or unacceptable. And this is all based on the desired outcome result of the experiment. What is the goal of the experiment? How much precision does the experimental results require? For example, if they could use low-income children, non-consenting parents as the control group, and the level of bias that that introduces to the experiment is small enough to where they can still come to a solid conclusion on, on if the vaccine is effective or not, then go ahead and, and do the experiment that way. Have your cake and eat it too, right? But in this case, there was too much bias using the low-income children as the control group. So what they decided to do was choose their test subjects from a population of children. This population of children consisted of only children with parents who consented to the vaccine. So this doesn't mean that every single one was high income. It was just more probable that a child of a consenting parent would be coming from a high income family. So again, they decided to choose test subjects from a population of children that was strictly consenting parents. And so these test subjects were subjects for the control group and the treatment group all came from the, this population. And therefore, that confounding variable of low-income children that are more immune to the disease was eliminated. However, there still was that ethical issue of deliberately not giving certain children who, with consenting parents, the vaccine. But I guess they felt that this was the only way to do a controlled experiment at the level of detail and precision that they needed. And so you could also imagine that the population of these consenting children that they chose was also as random as they could make it. In other words, they didn't just choose second grade children or third grade children. And perhaps they only chose children from school districts that had a high outbreak of the, of the disease. Because districts with low outbreak, that could be another confounding variable. The vaccine is working, but how much of that is just because there's not a high outbreak in the area? So I don't have every exact detail of this story, but you can imagine they chose children from grades one to three and only from districts that had a high level of outbreak. And also, and furthermore, they chose a sufficient number of children. You can't use too few children. You want a high enough data set, which also helps to keep things random or purely statistical, you could say. Now, another question that came up is they had their population of children to choose from, right? The children with consenting parents from those school districts, 
But which child do you assign to which group? And it was suggested that perhaps they needed a human to decide, like to, to use human judgment. In other words, a person would take a look at a child's family income, general health, personality, and social habits, and then decide which group to put them in, the treatment or the control group. However, experience shows that human judgment often results in substantial bias. It's better to, to rely as much as you can on impersonal chance. And so what they did was they pretty much just flipped a coin. You have a child, doesn't matter what the child's background is, it doesn't matter anything about the child, they're coming from that general pop, chosen population, flip a coin to, to send them into the treatment group or the control group. And you can think about why this works, because if you have a sufficient number of subjects, then this method is going to be end up being completely random, right? If, you, if I flip a coin enough times, it's, it's going to approach 50% heads, 50% tails. But you need a sufficient number of flips because I can flip a coin five times and I just might happen to get four heads and a tails, right? So that's not enough flips. I, but if with enough flips of the coin, it's going to approach 50-50 heads, tails, okay? And this procedure and this impartial chance procedure that's used to assign subjects to the treatment or the control group, when you do it this way, the experiment is said to be randomized controlled. And so you can think about this as the, the coin flipping procedure, but you can also think about an experiment being randomized controlled being the whole process of choosing that, that random population combined with the, the coin flipping procedure. An experiment that's randomized controlled is where the full process of assigning subjects to the control group or the treatment group is random. The population that you choose and the, and the assignment procedure. Now, something else that was used to ensure that the experiment was as much of an ideal controlled experiment as possible was a placebo. A placebo is a treatment that looks real, but is intended to have no actual effect, right? A treatment applied to the treatment group. So what they did was they had a shot that had the vaccine and another shot that was just salt water. This way, the, the, the subjects, the, ch the, the kids, didn't know whether or not they actually received the vaccine. And the reason for this is because you, you don't want a kid to feel like they have symptoms or to be saying they have certain symptoms subconsciously based on the knowledge of whether or not they, had, they got the vaccine. There are stories that talk about studies where fake painkillers are given to, to given to people and they are citing that their their pain was relieved right so so the, uh, the the placebo ensures an even more of a controlled experiment right remember the goal here a perfectly controlled experiment is you're setting it up to where the only variables that are at play if it's perfect the only variables that are at play when you're comparing the control group to the treatment group are the independent variables right so using a placebo is necessary for, for getting this perfect control experiment, controlled experiment, okay? Now, using the placebo makes the subjects blind, but they also wanted the experimentalists to be blind. They wanted to have a double-blind study, meaning that the doctors who were inspecting for whether or not the, the child had polio didn't know if the child they were inspecting got the vaccine or not, because there could be some ambiguity. It wasn't completely obvious in certain cases whether or not the, the, the child had polio and how severe it was. So with a double-blind study, the subjects don't know whether they received the placebo and neither do the experimentalists. And again, to have the most ideal controlled experiment, you, you want it to be double-blind. The experiment doesn't have to be double-blind, but for the most ideal controlled experiment, it, it should be. It will be. Okay, so here's the results of the experiment. Here's the experiment we, we talked about, the, the well-designed experiment. And this was another experiment that wasn't deemed to be well-designed. So, okay, you have the treatment in the control group. The, these were all from consenting parents, right? They also tested the, uh, the non-consenting the non children 
this is kind of a, you could look at this on the side. And this is the, the polio rate, rate, rate of having polio per 100,000 subjects. If, if you look at the rate per subject, then you don't have to have the treatment group and the control group be the exact same size as long as both are a, have, have a sufficient size. Right, the treatment group could be two million. The control group could be a half a million. If a half a million is a, is is a sufficient size, then you just need to compare the rate per subject or the rate per a certain amount of subjects, so you can get a, a you know numbers that are easy to easy to to see, to easy to work with and visualize. Right, if they did the rate per subject, these would be way too large numbers, but so they can work with these smaller numbers under a hundred doing rate per 100,000. And so you can see that the control group, from the treatment group to the control group, the rate, there was, a, there was a large decrease. So the conclusion was that the vaccine worked. Based on how we talked about how this experiment was set up, you can make a, a, a good conclusion that the vaccine works. And if you look at the, the for the non-consenting children, the, parent, the, the children whose parents didn't consent to the vaccine, so they obviously didn't receive the vaccine, it makes sense that, look, if you compare the control group to this, the rate's lower, right? Because these children, because both of these didn't receive the vaccine, this was the, you know, pro proportionally higher income children, or really the, the consenting, which, which should have more higher income children. And it makes sense. This, just like they thought, this rate is lower. These, are more, these kids are more immune. Now, if you compare to the poorly conducted study, they were picking students by grade level, which we talked about could introduce biases. They had only consenting parents that were the, in the treatment group. And in the control group were mixed, treatment and non-treatment, consenting and non-consenting. And so what you end up with is a bias against the vaccine because the, the non-consenting parents are mixed in here. So this rate, this rate compared to the, the, the 54 to compared to the 71, this, this 54 is lower. So the, the 25 and the 28 here in the treatment group, these were both, con these were both consenting from, from children with consenting parents. So these are about the same. But you drop here about 30 points, and here you drop about 43 points. So again, this is biased against the vaccine because there's less of, there's less of, a, of a drop in polio cases due to, due to the ad administration of the vaccine. But again, it's important to note that there is still a drop here, and you and it's it's not a it's not insignificant. It's a, again, thirty. What is it? Twenty nine point drop. So maybe that maybe that could could have been enough to conclude that the vaccine works. I'm not a doctor. I, I, a doctor would have to make that decision. But I'm, I just want to make it clear: there's no perfectly controlled experiment. You have to decide which biasing or confounding variables, the effect of those variables, are acceptable for the, the objective of the study.